Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on mentors and motivators who are consistently reshaping, redefining, and rediscovering the field of medical health care. I am pleased to welcome Dr. Tara Scott, a physician with a passion for treating hormone-related issues, conquering chronic illness, and evidence-based practices. Thank you so much for joining us at the A4M Spring Congress. Thank you. It's so exciting to be here. How are you? Good. Good, good. I wanted to begin a little bit with your background on uh, obstetrics and gynecology. Can you share sort of what brought you down that path? Sure, I had a very traditional start. I did a, a residency in OBGYN. I joined the busiest practice in town, delivered a lot of babies, did a lot of surgery, um, and that's kind of how everybody starts out, right? And everybody has something that happens to them that makes them look at another way of doing things. So for me, it was the start was really my own struggle with infertility, having to take a lot of fertility drugs, looking at uh, abnormalities. And I was invited to attend uh, integrative medicine, functional medicine by a colleague. And that kind of opened my eyes to looking at root cause. And mm -hmm. so I just really started studying a lot about um, integrative medicine and functional medicine as it pertained to women's health. Right. Menopause, perimenopause, infertility, irregular periods. And then I did actually my A4M fellowship and finished in 2012. And most of my practices focused on wellness and women's health because everybody, like I said, always has kind of a reason. So 11 years ago, my brother suddenly passed away. He was 38 years old, but he was a diabetic. He was on insulin. He was on a statin. He was a smoker. He was sedentary. He was stressed. He was overweight. He had every risk factor. But to traditional medicine, he was healthy. So that really was what really turned me the other direction is thinking there's really got to be a better way to be preventive. And instead of trying to treat people here, why don't we meet them back here and prevent diabetes, prevent. And so a lot of that has to do with wellness, has to do with hormone balance. So that's where I kind of expanded my reach more than just getting people to have resolution of symptoms, but preventing disease as well. So infertility, what did they tell you in med school? compared to what you learned in some of your integrative studies? So uh, in med school, what you're taught is you're taught diagnosis, right? And then algorithms. So there's no ovulation. So you're gonna rule out one, two, three. When you rule out these things, then you treat them doing one, two, three. There's not like, well, why is there no ovulation? You just, so I just fall, fell under unexplained infertility. You know, so you ruled out these causes, these are present, and then you have a treatment algorithm. So you, you're not trained to think about why and to dig deep like you are in functional and integrative medicine. So when you began, I guess you graduated the fellowship in 2012. 2012. What were the common concerns in, in your female patients at that time compared to what you're seeing and currently? in your female patients? Has it changed at all? It, it's changed a little bit because at the time, a lot of it was a more natural approach to menopause and perimenopause and hormone replacement and hormone balancing and PCOS. And so as I learned more, I learned how much I didn't know, right, and kept learning and studying and doing coursework and everything through other organizations. And what I started seeing deeper cause of is endometriosis and breast cancer and how it relates to estrogen metabolism, which is one thing I'm just so passionate about. You know, as someone who had endometriosis and later cured it based on a functional approach, you know, after I've had the third surgery, saw that you know, what was there the first surgery is no longer there. So um, that's really where my passion lays right now. We still treat you know, women of any age and um, try to do a, a functional approach to their hormonal imbalances, but if I could have a microphone for anything, it would be digging deeper as to causes of estrogen dominance, of, in, of infertility, of endometriosis, and specifically premenopausal breast cancer. So when you, thinking on hormones, when you first began, and we have a lot of practitioners out there this weekend, they're still a bit nervous. There's hurdles to practicing it, right? Sure. When you first got into it, did you have a little bit of that, you know, skepticism? Were you unsure? 
and how do you talk about hormones to your patients today? Well, what was amazing to me is that I did four years of study in OBGYN and I still do not know about hormone therapy. I mean, it just boggles my mind. And so patients don't understand that we are not taught this, what we're taught here. We're not taught about the biochemistry, about the physiology, about receptors, about the, we, we are not taught about menis menopause. So I'm actually fortunate enough that I'm teaching the residents in the town that I, I'm in. So at least they get something, some, you know, I lecture them and teach them about my approach. Is that university affiliated? Um, it's uh, at Neomed. Yeah, so it, uh, Neomed is a community program with three um, hospital cities. So I'm at Summa Health, which is in Akron, Ohio. So I'm the medical director of integrative medicine there. And so I lecture to the OBGYN residents. That's reassuring. Yeah, yeah. So There's I mean, some movement. There is some movement. It's been slow, right? And so, so there is so much more evidence now than when I started this journey, you know, 15 years ago learning about hormones. There's so many more studies. There's so many more options for education for a practitioner coming here. You know, before there really wasn't a lot when I was going down this journey. So there are the resources. Of course, now online, you have everything at your fingertips, you know, so that, so it does make it easier to get that reinforcement if you're somebody who's just starting out on this journey. So I'm a new patient. I've Googled hormones, but I'm coming to you because I'm just not feeling well. I'm tired. How do you bridge into the conversation? How do you say that, hey, perhaps these are protocols? So most of the that time people yeah, people are pretty interested in the testing because they want to know, right? And so there's I sometimes I have to convince them if it's something that well, well my doctor already tested my hormones or why is this not covered by my insurance? So I have to explain a little bit about, you know, optimal wellness and insurance like your car insurance doesn't cover your auto, your oil change, it just covers your hospitalization. So I have to kind of walk them through that as that, you know, we're not the healthcare is not sit uh, it's set up as sick care, we're not really healthcare because we're, we're just dealing with the sick people. And so what I'm trying to do is prevent things, you know, deaths, premature deaths like my brother. So there's a conversation about here's what I think is going on and let's do some testing. And then once we do the testing, we personalize a protocol for them instead of just looking at, you know, like what I was taught in OBGYN residency. If it's not this, then give this. So it's more of a personalized approach that you're deficient in this, there looks like an imbalance, and if I find there's an imbalance between estrogen and progesterone, then we're gonna search for the cause. What do you think is the most complicated hormone? The, since they're all so interconnected, they're all complicated. You know, I think As a that, gynecologist, they would say that you know the ovaries and that's all you need to know, right? Right, and if you don't have ovaries, you're fine, right? <laughs> if you don't have a uterus, you don't need progesterone. Those are common wow. myths that still exist in traditional medicine. So, And even being part, before I broke off with my own functional medicine practice, I was part of a multi doctor, 16 doctors of OBGYNs that we worked together. And I still had to try to get them, please don't, please don't write synthetic hormones. Please give progesterone even after a hysterectomy. Wow. So, you know, some of them caught on, some of them didn't or still remain very traditional in their ways, so. The lecture you're speaking on this weekend is titled An Integrative Approach to Gynecological Cancer. Cancers. Yes. Can you give us some broad strokes about what you intend to, to cover in that? So basically, I, you know, I see a lot of patients at, either after their diagnosis or people who are at high risk for a diagnosis of breast or uterine cancer. And where I want to pick up is after they've already had their traditional therapy, because I certainly would not tell anyone not to have surgery, chemo, radiation, whatever they have. But once they get their clean bill of health, they're just left with, okay, you're fine. And let's just wait to see if it comes back. Well, rather than waiting to see if it comes back, I want to know why. Why do you have breast cancer? Let's look at your estrogen metabolism. Let's see, does your body get rid of estrogen? Do you have any genetic predisposition? And I'm not just talking about BRCA. I'm talking about within right. your hormones and how your hormones relate. Was there an imbalance that caused you to have cancer? And nine times out of 10, we find something. I mean, there are some wow. people that we find nothing, you know, but then we can still work on their stress levels. We can still work on their gut. We can still work on optimizing health. But nine times out of 10, we find something wrong with the way their body processes estrogen. So my message, first of all, is, you know, if you have cancer, breast cancer, or you've been treated for breast cancer, don't just wait, seek, you know, seek somebody who does integrative or functional medicine to look for a cause to minimize your chance of recurrence. So cancer is 
an environmental disease almost. For a lot of cancers, but there's a clear correlation in breast and uterine cancer with estrogen out of balance from progesterone. Okay. For sure. And the impact of some of the traditional therapies? So the traditional therapies are cut it out, burn it out, kill all dividing cells. And then once you're done and you have no evidence of disease, you're done. You know, I have had patients that are on tamoxifen and still have so much estrogen. And that concerns me. Why are we not worried that this patient has so much estrogen and they're not getting rid of it? And I've called oncologists and they're like, that's okay, she's on tamoxifen. So this is you know, part of what, what I've been passionate about, trying to get the word out. So really, mainly trying to reach the women because they're the ones who are driving the moment. You know? So they don't want to just sit and wait for their cancer to come back. In terms of preventative care, what are your everyday strategies, what are you talking about with your patients? In, as a trained to, to breast cancer or any patient? Any patient, your so, kind of everyday patient. We're definitely finding out you know, that lifestyle, including diet and sleep and stress, affects any disease. So those are things that it, when I was in my traditional doctor role, I didn't have time to talk to them about that and didn't even cross my mind to talk to them about that. So those are the hallmarks of any integrative or functional approach is to talk to patients about what they're eating, when they're eating, how they're sleeping, and how their stress is because inflammation is the hallmark of chronic disease, whether it be cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, any of those cardiovascular things. So the basics can get you pretty far. When you moved into preventative, functional, and integrative medicine, did you just go cold turkey from the practice you were in? You, you left your sort of traditional BGYN setting. Is your setting now a, a different model? So I did, I kind of weaned it. So basically okay. what happened is I was doing a lot of that out of my traditional practice. I had a separate day that I was doing my hormone days. Oh. And then when I graduated, I wanted to do something bigger. So I was a managing partner of our practice. So we, at one of our board meetings, I said, I want to open, you know, a separate practice or do some kind of program. Half of the, half of the doctors thought this is a great idea. Half of the doctor says this doesn't belong in an OBGYN practice. So what I did was started a separate practice kind of next door. So I worked at both practices for three years, and I kind of stopped delivering, then I stopped doing surgery, and as my functional medicine practice grew, it just got harder for me to work in the traditional environment where you have seven minutes to talk to a patient, and a patient comes in on a list of medications that are not helping the cause, and it just got hard for me. So I retired from OBGYN in 2016, and I'm just doing functional and integrative medicine now. Yeah. Have any of your old colleagues called you yet? Or are they yeah, you know, peaked? It's, it's like anything. Like they fear it and they get, you know, they scrutinize anything that's out of the norm. And I was pretty fortunate that being in the same town for 22 years, I at least had a good relationship with everybody. I had a good, uh, a good reputation as a pretty evidence-based person. So it's interesting to see them come full circle. And the CEO of the hospital is my old partner. The chairman of OBGYN is my old partner. You know, so now, like, the administration at the hospital knows me, and that's how, what's led us, uh, you know, led me into the job of being, starting an integrative medicine department. And how about tilting towards the future a bit? What are the therapies that are really exciting to you? on the horizon? So for me, I just think, I, I think it's so much more exciting that they, that there's so many more options for women. And now with social media, people are understanding that it has to be a personalized approach. So it's just like water. If we tell people to drink water, if you're running a marathon in 80 degrees, you need to drink a lot of water, but you wouldn't give that same recommendation to someone with kidney failure. So is water the problem? Or is it the clinical situation and the patient and what's going on, right? So that's just like hormones. It's a, are hormones bad or is it the person and what they're taking and what their levels are? So it's a whole new approach. Testing has become more affordable, more mainstream, more, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's available everywhere. I've had the opportunity to lecture about this in Australia and, and Singapore and Malaysia, the Philippines, and they have access to this kind of testing out there, some of the functional testing that we do, which is great. 
So it is moving and that's exciting compared to where I was, you know, when I started this journey 15 years ago. So that's super exciting. And, but mostly it's the awareness that the patients have because they're really driving the change because they're not settling for someone to tell them, oh, it's normal, just have a drink and you'll go to sleep. You know, your sleep problem isn't an issue, your hot flashes, your weight gain, you just need to eat less and exercise more. You know, so, I mean, they're definitely, these women, you know, have been dismissed by other providers saying that it's not your hormone. So that's exciting for me to be able to validate the people who've been to several doctors and then finally feel heard and finally feel hope that there's, they can feel better. The testing point you bring up is an interesting one. Testing now is a lot more thorough, right? Mm. And what do we get from the functional tests that maybe our traditional blood tests from our internists, et cetera, aren't showing us? Is it, you know, these debates about reference ranges? And well, part of it is reference ranges, yes, because those reference ranges are old and they're looking to detect tumor and disease, not imbalances. So what we're doing in functional medicine, is, and especially in a preventative wellness practice, is trying to look at imbalances. But with the traditional serum testing for hormones, often traditional doctors don't know when to order them, what time of the cycle, how to interpret them. And so now we have, there's tons of advertising to, the compu to consumers about saliva testing, urine testing, blood spot testing, all types of testing now is being advertised to the, to the patient. So they are coming in either getting them on Amazon. I've seen patients get mm. saliva testing on Amazon or they've already gotten them somewhere. So they're driving ahead and trying to find somebody who will work with them. It's empowering to see. Yeah, it's good and bad because if you order on Amazon and you don't really know and then you waste your money doing the test at the wrong time of your cycle or the wrong way or the wrong profile, but I was shocked to see it on Amazon. Great. What doesn't Amazon yeah, do? That's true. You gotta love it. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Scott, for sharing uh, some of your time with us this weekend. You're welcome. Here at the A4M Spring Congress. Thanks for the opportunity.